Um, okay, welcome everybody to the Managing Waste and Environmental Risk uh, webinar. Uh, I will be taking you through this today. My name is Natasha Day and I'm a Senior Planning Policy Officer uh, working in the Island Plan uh, team. And I'm joined on the call today with uh, Marion Jones, who will be funding the chat. So should you have any questions or queries, uh, please do ask um, into the chat or uh, pause for a natural break, uh, where I'll try and answer um, anything that may arise. So before we start, just going into some house rules. Um, please turn your uh, cameras off and be on mute. <laughs> I've just heard somebody just there cough, so please uh, could you just check that you are indeed on mute. Um, if you would like to um, ask a question, please raise your hand or use the um, the chat. As I said, I've got two devices on the go here, so I can try and see who's raising their hand, but technology isn't on my side today. Uh, so do, do just bear with me. Uh, when we reach a natural break, I will pick up any questions. Um, as you see here, that Andrew and has a, you have been notified on the emails that the webinar will be recorded. So if you aren't comfortable with this, please do uh, leave the call call now. Um, we'd also ask you to respect other participants' thoughts and opinions um, as and when they they may arise. And um, if you would like to uh, discuss any of the issues um, raised today in more detail, we will be having a one-to-one -one session after the event, uh, which will be held this Friday. My colleague Kevin Pelly will be taking the um, Managing Waste and Environmental Risk one-to-ones. So as with all the other uh, webinars, the, um, the standard format is to be followed. So we talk a bit about the consultation, uh, provide a brief overview of the plan, and then dive into the wastewater and environmental risk um, policies, and then conclude on the points of how to engage. So for those of you who are joined us on previous webinars. I do apologise that we will be going over the um, contextual parts of the plan again, uh, but that's for the benefit of those of you joining the call who have not yet um, uh, been to a webinar. So in terms of the consultation, um, as you're all aware, we are now um, live in a 12 week consultation on the draft bridging island plan. Uh, this is due to end on the uh, 12th of July this year. You can um, find all the information on gov.je forward slash um, island plan. Um, you can provide your views online um, following the um, the link that you find on the Island Plan homepage and then onto the give your views on the draft plan um, box as you see uh, shown on the slide here. <clears throat> in terms of where we are in the program, um, as many of you will understand that it's, it's taken some time to get to this point of, of the draft plan with lots of work going into the development of the plan, including uh, the development of the plan's evidence base. Um, now that we have published the plan, we've done two things. Um, First part is uh, to um, announce it publicly and allow the public to provide their views. And the other part of that is that we have lodged the plan uh, with the state's um, graph for state members uh, to start to submit their proposed amendments. So this is a slightly different process to what we uh, normally do when developing an island plan. And that's why we've uh, lodged the plan early, which enables states members to engage earlier and therefore allow for a shorter period of time uh, for what is a, a very long and involved uh, process from this point forward. So after the 12 week consultation has ended, um, the Minister for the Environment will consider all of the representations that have been received, both from members of the public and um, states members and provide an initial response that will then be passed over to um, independent planning inspectors who you may have seen have already been appointed um, who will consider the draft plan its evidence base um, the representations and the minister's initial response to those the inspector then considers the key issues that they feel need to be heard um, in public. They do consider all of the issues um, raised both uh, by us and, and by members of the public, but they will select the issues that are most contentious to be heard in public hearings. Um, you'll have an opportunity to comment on um, that list and you will also have an opportunity to submit further representations later down um, that part of the process before the public hearings are held and those public hearings are expected to take place uh, at the, either the end of October or the beginning of November this year. 
Um, after the inspector has held the hearings, they will then go away and, and write a report, which will then be submitted to the Minister for the Environment around uh, Christmas time, um, where the Minister will um, provide a further response, um, as you can see at this point here, um, provide a further response where he would um, outline whether or not he's minded to accept or reject um, the inspector's recommendations. And then we'll present that report to the state's assembly. At that point, state's members will be able to um, reconsider the proposed amendments that they've made at this very early stage in the process and um, make any further amendments that they feel um, are appropriate in light of everything that's been um, said and done throughout the examination uh, process. So this is a, a what we would call a process of iteration and refinement of state's members amendments before um, ultimately the uh, island plan is debated in the state's assembly in March 2022. So as you can see here, there is, a, there is a lot to get through in terms of uh, procedure, consultation and engagement and um, the public examination and scrutiny. <clears throat> as part of the um, event schedule for this initial consultation period, um, for many of you who are on the call, you've joined us for other webinars. Uh, this has been ongoing for around about a month now in terms of our engagement schedule, and we are reaching the end with the managing, um, uh, minimising waste and environmental risk uh, webinar today, the managing emissions webinar tomorrow, and then on Friday we will have the minimising waste and environmental risk one-to-one um, uh, -one session with Kevin Pilly and unfortunately we won't be able to hold the managing emissions one-to-one -one on Friday but we intend for that to be on, held on Tuesday uh, next week. For those of you who have any additional questions you'll be able to book on one of those one-to-one -one sessions. So as an overview of the draft plan uh, the plan itself um, is not just uh, the, the rather large document that you would have seen, but it is also the proposals map that must be read alongside the plan. <coughs> Excuse me. So the um, proposals maps comprise of four maps in this instance. It's normally um, two. Um, all of the detail is actually uh, held on the um, main proposals map, which is the part A and part B. And the inset maps are, are merely a, zoned in, a zoomed in version of those just to improve uh, legibility. We've had to split the maps out because of the level of detail um, and information that's required on them and the inclusion of the flood risk information, which we'll talk about later, which makes the plan, uh, the, the proposals maps quite difficult to interpret but all of the information should be read uh, together as the island plan proposals map. So this is the, the main planning zones map, uh, the flood risk map and the inset maps of St Helena where the information gets a little busier. In terms of the uh, structure and content of the plan, um, for those of you that are familiar with the 2011 island plan, you'll see that we have restructured um, the plan somewhat. We now have uh, four volumes to the plan. The first volume being the introduction and strategic proposals, which set the broad context. And then we have the strategic framework volume, which sets the um, strategic level priorities of the plan um, as a, both a policy framework and a, a spatial manifestation of those, those uh, policies. And then we have the managing development uh, uh, volume, which is the largest um, of the four. And this goes over the, the um, what I would call the bread and butter planning issues that would apply to um, different types of development in different uh, circumstances. And then volume four, we have the performance and delivery uh, chapter of the plan where we will, um, where we set out the uh, ways in which we will monitor the progress of the plan in relation to um, both the policies that we have here and also the Jersey performance framework. So in terms of what you see in the document, um, all policies are accompanied by a, a, a preamble or a justification as it's uh, legally defined. Um, and that is a requirement and must be read in conjunction with the what you see in the blue box, which is the policy itself. The, the policy is the focus of planning decisions, but the all of the document and content should be read as the entire island plan. Um, and then we also have proposals, which you will see that are in a green box and those uh, set out things that um, we feel need to be done in order to support the effective implementation of the plan. And quite often those are things like do, do a further piece of work to either research or provide guidance on a very specific issue. So in terms of the plan um, structure and what it means, as I said, the strategic context um, volume of the plan um, sets out the 
the broad uh, context for everything that sits within. So all of the managing development policies and strategic policies should be responding to the context that we um, that we have um, in Jersey and also responding to the Jersey performance framework, which is um, for those of you who may remember the uh, future Jersey consultation that was undertaken in 2017, it's, it's basically a measure of how Jersey is doing against um, a range of uh, performance metrics. In terms of the plan's evidence base, all of this is now published on gov.je. Um, most recently, we have published the independent sustainability appraisal that was published about two weeks ago, um, which uh, is um, a very useful document to set out how the plan responds to key sustainability issues of the island. And then all of the rest of the evidence base is uh, focused on uh, really thematic issues and some of which we'll talk about in a bit more detail as I dive into the thematic policies today. In terms of um, the structure and content that we will be looking at today, I'll talk to you a little bit about the strategic policy framework and then we'll go straight to the uh, minimising waste and environmental risk policies. Um, before I go into the detail, does anybody have any questions um, at this stage? So as with um, previous webinars, the slides uh, which we will be sharing after the event, I've got a small key uh, which helps you to understand um, whether or not something is an existing policy that is essentially unchanged, so it may just be slightly reframed. Um, an existing policy that is changing in some way, so maybe a, a measure might have been changed or something is an entirely new policy that isn't currently in the island plan. So in terms of the strategic policies that relate to this chapter, <clears throat> of course, one of the key ones um, is how we are responding to climate change. And this strategic policy has uh, embraces both angles of climate change, um, both uh, our response in terms of building um, our resilience to the effects of climate change and also our response in terms of reducing carbon emissions that contribute to climate change. And this is all set within the wider context of the declaration of a climate emergency. Uh, we also have the spatial strategy, which set, um, sets out where um, development is to be focused over the plan period, uh, which focuses development really into the existing built up areas where there's better access to um, services and road networks. And then we also have the planning for community needs SP, uh, which uh, strengthens a focus on livability in communities. And of course, um, resilience and, and environmental risk in particular is important for that. Does anybody have any questions on the strategic policies? OK. So for the purposes of the webinar, we've split the policies between waste and water themed and um, other environmental risk. And this isn't how it's necessarily cut in the plan. It is actually read in that order, um, but this is just to uh, basically compartmentalise with a similar issues. So in terms of um, the waste and water policies, there are a range of issues that are dealt with in this chapter of the plan. Uh, waste minimisation is effectively construction waste. Uh, managing flood risk is um, the island's um, strategic approach to dealing with flood risk areas, which is an entirely new uh, framework for Jersey and a new evidence base that's been produced to support that. Uh, we have the development along um, coastal flood defences, the coastline and water courses, which is a relatively closely linked policy to the managing flood risk. Uh, we have a land reclamation uh, policy in here, which um, previously would have been uh, purely focused on our on our response to waste. But we now have a again, a new context where there is both a response to waste, but also a response to flood risk um, brought out into that uh, policy framework. We have the Water Pollution Safeguard Area, which is about um, water quality and pollution risk um, in, in relation to um, catchment areas, uh, which is closely then linked to the surface water drainage uh, policies. And then leading on to that is the uh, foul sewerage policies. So um, 
I will go through each of these in a little bit more detail in the following slides. So last week we held a webinar um, to deal with um, minerals and waste on the island, and this this one policy is is relatively uh, closely linked uh, to the the waste element of that chapter, and it's also quite closely linked to a policy that we have in the general development chapter about um, the demolition and replacement of buildings. So looking at this policy. Um, focused here on its own. It's really about ensuring that when um, demolition and construction activity takes place, that we ensure that um, due consideration is given to minimising waste uh, that is produced um, as a result of that activity um, in, in order of the waste hierarchy. So first of all, we want to reduce the waste being produced in the first instance, and then we want to be able to reuse that waste as far as um, technology and um, capabilities will allow. And if we cannot reuse it, we will uh, recycle it or compost it in another way. And if that cannot happen, then it will be um, either recovered um, uh, or, or put through the energy from waste uh, plant. And as the least desirable um, option is to go um, to landfill. So, so the linkage there obviously is uh, particularly around the management of inert waste and uh, reducing the amount of landfill by uh, bringing it into uh, secondary aggregates for the construction industry, which was dealt with on the previous webinar. If you're interested in that, you, you can find the webinar on gov.je. So what we've done with this policy is to um, to dial it up um, somewhat is that previously it applied to uh, 10 or more homes or over a thousand square metres of development. Now we are asking that uh, the policy comes into play um, at five or more homes or 200 square metres of development. So quite a reduction in terms of the trigger point um, in which this policy will apply. Um, there is supplementary planning guidance already um, out there about the development of site waste management plans. And despite the threshold of the policy changing, um, that, that guidance would um, still stand. So what, what you would have to do um, if a developer is um, triggered by this policy is produce a site waste management plan where you evidence how you are focusing on um, meeting the waste hierarchy through all of the construction waste generated on site. Does anybody before I move on, does anybody have any questions on waste minimization policy? So moving into managing flood risk, um, these are the two key evidence-based reports that were developed. Um, well, one of them was actually before um, the development of the plan um, and one was um, specifically for the plan. So um, in January 2020, uh, Government of Jersey published its uh, shoreline management plan that explored the um, coastal flood uh, risk across the island um, and how we should deal with um, our coastal sea defences in the short, medium and long term. That, that piece of work set out a long term plan for, for Jersey and coastal flood defences, which is um, brought into the island plan in terms of where um, we would expect to see um, uh, sea defences protected or in the case of land reclamation, advance the line proposals, which I will touch on uh, in a moment. We undertook the strategic flood risk assessment to um, basically consider the coastal flood risk um, in the island in conjunction with the inland flood risk in the island. So the inland flood risk is, is primarily obviously by um, rainfall and we know that um, not only are our sea levels uh, rising as a result of climate change but also we are seeing increased rainfall. So those two issues um, becoming um, more of a problem into the long term or we expect it to become more of a problem into the long term for Jersey. So the strategic flood risk assessment brings those two issues together and helps us to define um, ways in which we can appropriately manage uh, the risk into the long term for Jersey. So what the policy or managing flood risk um, does, and this is taken directly from the evidence base and the recommendations of ACOM, is it classifies different development types based on their sensitivity. 
So the full list is actually available in the policy, um, but it essentially breaks it down between essential civil infrastructure. Uh, so that could be things um, like you know, ambulance and fire stations, hospitals, um, highly vulnerable uses. That could be your um, residential uses within highly vulnerable. You're less vulnerable, so that could be some kind of industrial use and you're water compatible. So that will be um, things like coastal flood defences or, or water sport activities. Um, we also have uh, two uh, different approaches for um, sensitivity based around built up areas and rural areas. And the reason for this is that um, in built up areas, there are better response times in terms of if there were to be an emergency and typically better infrastructure to deal with flood risk. In more rural areas, uh, there are slower response times uh, in case of emergency and also less um, infrastructure in available to deal with the flood risk. So hence why you can see there's some subtle differences um, in the tables as to whether or not something would be acceptable based on the location in which it is to take place. So in terms of how this um, translates in terms of the policy framework, the whole island is uh, categorised um, by a flood risk area. So you're little of uh, a, most of the islands you see is, is white, which means there's no flood risk, which is which is great. Um, the low risk um, areas are categorised for inland flooding, but not for coastal flooding. And you can see those on the um, the upper map. Um, here. So the, the, the colours are probably in reverse of what you would expect to see is that the lighter colour um, in the centre is the, the highest um, risk area and the darker colour is the lowest risk area. So you can see actually a lot of town along the south coast, along the east coast, um, is considered to be uh, within a, a low risk area and uh, moving up towards the north, that's where you get some of the more medium to high risk areas. In terms of the uh, coastal flooding, um, the highest risk area is immediately along the coastline. Um, where we have existing uh, breaches of coastal sea defence um, taking place from time to time. And obviously our um, environment, uh, housing and infrastructure department are you know, always working to improve our coastal sea defences. And then you have the medium risk um, of, of flood, which comes much further inland. And you'll see on the tables here that the the calculation of flood risk is uh, taken taking on a probability of a, of a flood event based on um, a, a uh, percentage risk over a period of time. So for the um, inland flood risk, it, it goes on a one in 1,000 year event, which is not quite a biblical, biblical event, but it's um, getting there. So it is really quite low risk. Um, and then escalating up to a one in 100 year event, which is more like the kind of event that we would expect to see um, um, at the moment. And then a one in 30 year event. So that's quite a, a high frequency event uh, to take place in terms of inland flooding. And then your coastal uh, flooding is, is done on a slightly different uh, basis, which is your one in 200 year event um, plus a, a 100 year epoch for climate change. So this is adding 100 years of sea level rise in terms of what um, the risk is there. And the high risk is without the 100 year epoch for um, uh, climate change. This is based on current sea levels, the high risk. Does anybody have any questions on the managing flood risk policies? And I can't see into the chat, I'm afraid, so I don't know if somebody is, has posted any questions on any of the themes. OK. OK, so unless somebody speaks up, I'm going to assume no. This basically just summarises um, the um, response in the policy to um, those tables. So the, we have the um, the key questions that we would ask in response to uh, where the development is to take place in relation to a flood risk area. So we'd ask, is it appropriate relative to the sensitivity? Um, is it appropriate subject to some mitigation? So you'd get that in your low, medium and high risk um, areas that we may allow development subject to some additional measures to make the development more resilient. 
Um, is the location of the development justified? So that that is a, a test really in terms of um, uh, the higher risk areas where we wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with, with the development, but if there was a real um, strong and clear reason for doing so, we, we may allow it to happen. Um, and then ultimately, in some cases, should we be supporting the development at all, uh, which would be your highly sensitive um, development proposals in a high risk flood, uh, flood high flood risk area with um, no additional justification to support that location. In all cases, um, when development is to happen within a flood risk area, we would ask for a flood risk assessment um, to be submitted. Um, we've also we would um, like to produce supplementary planning guidance um, to support that, but in the um, the flood risk assessment produced by ACOM, there is an example of how those can be produced and the key considerations that we would be looking for in a flood risk assessment. We've also um, included a proposal um, at this juncture for um, a catchment flood management plan, which we would develop um, in collaboration with colleagues in both um, IHE and Government of Jersey and uh, Jersey Water. And that, that is, of course, to help reduce the risk of um, inland flood risk in particular. So in terms of the flood infrastructure policies, again, this is a new policy. Um, we would um, look to carefully consider development that's in close proximity to a coastal sea defence or a designated uh, watercourse or other flood defence for that matter um, in the island. Uh, and it will only be supported where um, it is appropriate and necessary and will not prevent the effective operation um, of the flood um, um, infrastructure and be that a natural bit of infrastructure, i.e. a watercourse, um, or a man-made uh, infrastructure such as a, a coastal sea defence. Um, the policy also um, supports proposals for new flood infrastructure where they are required, particularly where they are consistent with the um, proposals set out in the shoreline management plan. Um, we would like to see that they are adequate um, to be resilient into the longer term and uh, that their environmental impact must be acceptable. We've included a proposal uh, to support this policy uh, to look at coastline and watercourse buffers. And for those of you that are familiar with the drainage law, you will know that um, a buffer of five metres is actually defined for um, the coastline and watercourse, uh, but, but um, a difficult to um, implement measure for planning purposes. So we would look to develop supplementary planning guidance to um, define and be very clear on the width um, of buffer strip that we would expect to see around um, coastal sea defences and inland watercourses uh, that is appropriate for planning purposes. Does anybody have any questions? Question for me. Okay. So moving on to the land reclamation <clears throat> policy, as I mentioned um, earlier on, this Bridging Island plan um, moves land reclamation from being a um, purely a, a, an inert waste management um, uh, strategy to uh, focus instead on being a flood risk um, strategy. So the shoreline management plan for Jersey set out um, a, a range of e basically epochs around the island and what the coastal um, uh, flood risk um, response should be. So I'm not sure if you can appreciate on the key here because it is quite small. Um, we have proposals um, in there to consider um, advance the line into the medium term. So that is this um, green dotted line that you see along the south coast here um, uh, um, around St Avon's Bay and also the green dotted line that you see around um, Half Day Park. And now what advanced the line means is that rather than um, just simply a, a adapting or extending the existing coast, coastal sea defence, that the best option may well be to extend outwards towards the sea. So that, that essentially would give us some form of land reclamation, the scale of which to be determined by, of, of course, detailed design uh, relative to um, the engineering solutions that would be proposed uh, accompanied to the um, land reclamation. What we would like to see um, 
if this is brought forward as a proposal, is that the um, land reclamation activity not only um, addresses uh, coastal flood risk response, uh, rather than being a, a simply an inert waste um, management uh, facility, uh, that it must be proven to be in the island's strategic interests that the environmental impacts are outweighed by the community benefit. So community benefit would be a combination of both um, uh, the, the resilience that we'd give to the island and also potentially some additional land um, that could be used to the benefit of the community. So that could be um, the provision of open space or new homes. Um, and that it, overall the environmental impacts are acceptable and mitigated um, or compensated as far as, as possible. And of course this type of proposal would um, trigger the need for an environmental impact assessment, which is required um, under the planning and building environmental impact um, order. Does anybody have any questions on the land reclamation policy? Yeah, Natasha, I've got my hand raised. Oh, hi there, John. Hi. Um, yeah, a bit of a big question, sorry. Okay. Um, going back in time to when Stuart Sivray first put the proposition to the states for the inquiry, um, the Committee of Inquiry into the Toxic Incinerator Ash Dumping in the St Helier Waterfront, at the time, and this was 2008, um, it didn't pass the states, there were only 13 votes in favour of the inquiry. The sort of rather, well I'm, I'm not going to use any strong words, but the sort of response it got. Jim Pershard, for instance, said it would be a waste of money and he indicated it was going to cost £250,000 to have the inquiry. Since then, just as a for instance, the overrun uh, to cope with the pollution on the waterfront just for one building, which is now IFC1, which was building four, was well over a million pounds in terms of extra um, than expected uh, for the uh, handling of the contaminated spoil. So it's, it really is a shame, first of all, that the inquiry didn't take place. Whilst, to be fair, uh, at an earlier stage, it was, it was clear that the, the states had realised the folly of their ways. But I think, you know, moving forward, the fact that they still, uh, to this day, dig that spoil out and send it to cells at La Collette to be simply buried again is just absolutely ludicrous. There were other scientific methods to contain the likes of asbestos. You know, you can you, you use electrification and, and um, seal it in glass um, so that it doesn't do, do any further damage or pollution. And there's two aspects to this. Number one, um, as you know, Horizon recently had uh, contamination because of the effect of the tide coming into the site on washing the contaminants out into the marina. It was rather sad that only went to magistrates court, court and a paltry £10,000 fine was made. It was it was a much bigger event than that. I would call it egg ecocide. And the fact that um, SOS Jersey shellfish report, 10 year shellfish reports, shows the massive pollution that we're doing in our oceans is, is proof of that. Now, what concerns me is that we don't seem to have a policy to do something sensible with the spoil that we are going to be, continue to dig out from the waterfront. All we have at the moment is three years life left at La Collette to bury it. Now, perhaps not for this generation, but for generations to come, when we decide to move the fuel um, facility from La Collette, because we won't be using fossil fuel so much, we will probably want to build more homes there. So we will have exactly the same situation of having to dig up the spoil yet again at huge cost. We just seem to be going in circles and I just can't understand why um and i was rather rather surprised to see your your comments a little bit earlier i've just i'll just quote them that environment environmental impacts are outweighed by community benefit well yeah that's fine if you can contain the environment environmental impacts but it, it seems that the states haven't learned their lesson so um you know i'm really of losing faith in the capability of this plan and in fact this and previous governments and maybe future governments to look after the environment that was my comment okay thank you um so obviously i can only speak for sorry i'm echoing can everybody hear me echoing no you're fine okay peculiar <laughs> <laughs> thank you um so obviously i can't really speak for the legacy issues um of you know historic 
um, management of waste uh, in the island. And, um, you know, as a as an islander, it, it, it is um, concerning to see uh, waste being dug up and reprocessed and then dug up and reprocessed. Um, unfortunately, as an island, we do have limited options, however, to deal with our uh, particularly contaminated waste, um, but we are getting better and we, you know, certainly we're documenting and understanding what we're doing with our inert waste so that we can deal with it um, appropriately as the next cycle um, inevitably comes round. Uh, in terms of the land reclamation policy that we have here and, and your comment about the environmental impact uh, being outweighed by community benefit, um, perhaps that's a framing issue that's, that's in no way to say um, that we would allow significant environmental impact um, because that that isn't what that is meant to mean. It's meant to mean that, that the environmental impact would be moderate and therefore outweighed by a significant community benefit. If the community benefit was not significant and the environmental impact would be um, moderate in whichever way that may be, um, then of course it would not be supported. So um, it, it's just a, a choice of words on a slide there, but if, in practice it wouldn't mean that. There would it would be subject to a full um, detailed assessment and if the environmental impacts were so severe the development would not be um, able to be approved. Okay I think my concern Natasha is is the validity of the fact that we have people out here that show the government you know that this pollution is, is, is real. Uh, I know that SOS Jersey did uh, tell um, Lee Henry SO, and SOJDC the pollution levels at the finance centre were about 25 percent in that topsoil. Lee Henry, uh, prior to the development, insisted it was only 5% and, and turn, turned down any communication to accept that um, that result. And of course, SOS Jersey were right. So I'm just concerned that the government keeps burying its head in the sand in terms of the, the, the amount of pollution that we've well, got no. over the whole of the waterfront and the method by which they can handle it. And there are very good scientific methods of handling these the spoil other than burying it that's that's my concern yeah thank you okay uh, does anybody else have any uh, thing to say on the land reclamation uh, policies no. okay and um, just just actually just to go back on um uh, uh, your points there john um before i conclude on this is that um so if somebody could uh, go on mute, thank you, um, is that, of course, the uh, land reclamation policy, as um, is in the plan, would only look to deal with the cleanest um, of uh, inert waste and would not be looking to bury contaminants onto our waterfronts, um, as we had seen historically. So just to clarify that point, that certainly we would not be looking to bury contaminants here. OK, I think Dave Cabaldew has his hand raised. OK. Hi there, David. Hi, uh, Nasha. Sorry, I'm late to the party, but um, no I had all sorts of problems. Um, okay. Natasha, uh, John, John was very, very kindly went through the history, which uh, I won't repeat. Um, I've got two, two, two significant questions here. Uh, one, uh, we, we, when we met SOJDC recently, uh, the first question that we asked them was, "Have any has anybody uh, worked out the volumes of the?" Contaminated pill that they would have to deal with, and they said no. They would uh, look at uh, look at speaking to someone at the college and find out. Well, we've had it done now, and um, actually, before I tell you, uh, we actually were uh, registered as a consultee, and I believe that um, when you remove the assessment of waste management on the island plan, you should have actually come to a list of the registered consultees before you carried on. But we weren't consulted in that in that stage, and then uh, the independent assessor was only. Uh, was only appointed two months ago, uh, uh, whereas the registered consultees were not told before the initial scoping. Now uh, we're into uh, you know, a much further down the line uh, situation. Um, anyway, th this is by the by, but uh, this will be raised because I don't believe it is right for uh, any, any, that's not me by the way, that's somebody else who got their mute point. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Um, so I'd like to sort of just put in the fact that the list of consultees was not taken on board before you, uh, things moved on to the way that's the stage they are now. Okay. Uh, could could I board... just ask for you to clarify to me what, um, what thing you think has been removed? Well, the assessment of waste management and the island plan has sort of been taken out, the original island plan, and so it doesn't seem to be there anymore. 
Um, no, no, it, it is, it is there. So um, not, in, not in the right sort of set. I mean, the thing is, I, I'm not bringing it up as a, as a big deal at the moment. I'm just saying that uh, we have always um, been on a list of registered consultees, and as things have gone on in the last few months and last year, um, we have not been, we have, we have not been asked to um, meet anyone in the last two, two years comment on anything in the last two years, bring our expertise to the table. The only thing that's happened is we got a flea on our ear about the shellfish study, which we did, even though it was done in a very, very scientific, proper way. We had the proper things done, and it's not for this meeting, but it was done. And all, all, all we got was uh, um, John Young said, oh, actually, I have no time to read it. But my officers say it, was, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't really uh, up, to, up to scratch. Uh, but they'll, they'll be in touch with you in a few days and three weeks ago we still haven't heard from them but that's by the by the volume which i really need to bring to the table here the volume to be excavated um, from the waterfront um, is as, as follows rather than give you metric tons and so forth let me put it this way uh, the difference between what the collect could possibly cope with if they designated all their spare land to be uh, to be pits from now until the waterfront is completely done uh, if, if even allowing for that, uh, there would still be a shortfall of 347,400 metric tonnes. Or, if you put it another way, that's 140,000 Olympic swimming pools. Or, uh, if you put it another way, that's 450,000 lo large lorry movements over the course of the, of, the, um, uh, of, of, the, of the period. Now, I don't think that uh, you, you say that uh, some of this would be uh, environmental impact on humans, uh, on, the, on the populace would be uh, outweighed by the benefits. I don't think any of this would happen because we have, uh, we have uh, cast iron proof uh, that asbestos dust impacted um, was released from IFSC4. Um, and that was just one issue. If you have this going on, you cannot transport all that material cleanly without, without letting brown asbestos fibers into the atmosphere without it making so many different different health risks for the population it cannot be done uh, and also look it will be full there's nowhere else to put it uh, it's an impossibility it, it's, it doesn't you must start anything you do uh, from first basis and that is to find out the volume of, of the excavation of, of contaminated fill and work out what you're going to do with it before you do anything else uh, and I think this has got to be put up, it's got to be flagged up absolutely at the beginning now. Uh, we really need uh, a health and safety risk assessment to, uh, in the scoping stage, um, rather than sort of going down the that, we, 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 that uh, SOJDC have already gone without even doing it. And I was wondering what your, your opinion of this was. Yeah, I mean, of course, today we're here to talk about the land reclamation policies um, and it, well, obviously we did also talk about the um, waste minimisation policy. I appreciate the points that you're making, but they're not actually um, directly related to this framework. Um, they are environmental concerns and they are, um, of course, particularly relevant to how we deal with contaminated land. Um, so I can direct you to the general development chapter to have a look there under the managing the health and well-being impact of uh, development policy which is policy GD1, um, which, which raises the importance of ensuring that the health and wellbeing impact um, of the community is not adversely affected by development, including the management of contaminated land. Um, so, uh, like I said, as much as I, I appreciate your, um, the points that you are making um, and that they have you know, some uh, relevance to the themes that we're talking about today, these are not actually directly relevant to the policy framework that we're talking about today, which is about land reclamation with clean inert waste on a different site. I think they are. I think it is relevant. I think it's very relevant. I think it is something you, you, you're just missing. It should be relevant. Health and well-being, safety should be relevant to land reclamation. Could you tell me, Natasha, have you, has your team worked out the, the amount of metric tonnage that would be needed to be put into the land reclamation? And have your team worked out the, um, the maximum amount that is available? Yeah, so that it's without a design on the table, it's absolutely impossible to um, calculate no, no, that. No, no, no. Without a design, have you actually, you must know the, the, the capacity left at the collect. You must know that before you even start to discuss anything. What no, is the capacity? 
at, at this at this point, these policies deal with the principles of the development, not the detail of the development. So you might want to take a look at the um, managing waste, uh, sorry, the uh, minerals and uh, waste and water uh, strategy, which will give you the numbers as far as we um, know them. I, I couldn't tell you them off the top of my head, but we have looked at the um, the volumes um, of waste and also the capacity at La Colla in that report. But you don't you can't you can't quote them off the top of your head because and you, and you can't you can't you can't tell me what they are i mean i can look them up obviously but i i do know what they are yeah. or i've got a good idea it's just yeah. that it's just that um i think this 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 seminar webinar was the one that we were scheduled to address these issues and you're not actually allowing us to address these issues within this webinar OK, so this this webinar is about me presenting the information to uh, to the public about what the policies contain. So the land reclamation policy that, that we're discussing now um, is talking about the principle. So only the principle, not the detail. The detail is a very, very important um, as you know, you've highlighted that the detail can have some um, very real challenges for Jersey uh, within it. But this at this stage, until there is proposals in relation to this policy framework, it's, it's absolutely impossible to say you know, talk about things like volumes of waste and fill. Um, it, it's entirely impossible to talk about that, that at this level now. So I don't mean to dismiss your concerns as issues. They are very real issues. And of course, the island plan tries to respond to those issues. Uh, but for the purposes of this webinar, which is not um, unfortunately an opportunity to provide representations in relation to the plan, it, it's actually designed to for us to share information with you about the content of the plan is that I would advise you to um, to, to put your um, your concerns into writing and submit them into the process um, as a representation to the plan, which of course we will uh, read and consider um, and the minister will provide a response. OK, thank you. Okay. So um, moving on to the uh, water pollution safeguard uh, area, this policy hasn't uh, changed uh, really in the uh, uh, draft bridging island plan. The defined area um, as a water pollution safeguard area remains also unchanged. Uh, so the principle will, will remain that development should not lead to unacceptable impact on the aquatic environment or the quality of water feeding into the island's uh, reservoirs. This has some uh, relationship to the surface water uh, drainage policies, which again, this policy does exist in the current island plan. Um, but it's been uh, slightly modernised and, and reframed in the draft bridging island plan is that we expect development to incorporate sustainable drainage this uh, uh, sustainable urban drainage systems uh, where it flexes water flow um, and this could be through uh, a permeable um, surfaces um, or discharging into um, appropriate uh, water course um, what we do not would uh, what we would not like to see is the discharge into the um, surface water um, drainage system particularly in town, given that um, the system is running at capacity. So that in itself um, raising some degree of flood risk for St Helier. So unless there are um, very good reasons for using sustainable um, drainage systems on site, um, we wouldn't uh, like to see them. So those reasons would be um, if they were likely to cause significant uh, land or water pollution, um, or if the ground site conditions would preclude their use, or if the size of the site would uh, uh, present, prevent their use. So for example, if you've got a, a site in St Helier where it is built ed edge to edge, it would be particularly difficult to include uh, Suds. In terms of the foul sewerage policies, again, this is a um, existing uh, framework that was established in the 2011 island plan, where we would like to see all development where possible um, connected to the uh, mains public foul sewer. I think we're we're running at over 90% of the island is now connected to the public foul sewer, which is great, and it's the only really the most rural parts of the island that are uh, yet to make a connection, and some of which um, may never be able to make a connection given um, uh, its lack of viability or, or um, practical ability to make the connection. So um, in such cases where a connection is not viable, and that could be because it um, extends through um, other people's property or the financial viability of making the connection is um, 
is well beyond what would be considered reasonable for the scale of development. Uh, we may accept a package treatment plant on the site, um, but this would have to um, ensure that it meets final um, standards and conditions in terms of the, um, the water quality and um, also that um, they are appropriately um, maintained into the future. Um, where we have some exceptions for the smaller scale development, so where you have existing properties in rural locations um, on, on tight tanks in particular, and in some cases um, soakaways, these may be accepted um, in the case of extending a dwelling, for example, but only where it can be proven that um, the existing system is performing well and has capacity to withstand um, any additional loading that a proposed development may put upon it. Uh, there is supplementary planning guidance that exists to support this policy and that, that advice would um, still stand if the bridging plan were to be um, adopted. Does anybody have any questions on the um, uh, foul or surface water uh, drainage policies? OK. So moving on to the um, the next uh, part of the policies, which are more just uh, around environmental risk. Um, this covers the safety zones for hazardous installations. Um, it includes the, um, the extension or alteration of hazardous um, installations and the aircraft noise zones and public safety zones. So in terms of the safety zones for hazardous installations, uh, for those of you that are familiar, we have them um, designated in various locations on the island, including um, at La Collette, where it is the, the highest uh, risk area. And we have it at uh, La Rouette, where there's a 250 uh, metre consultation distance to find around um, some fuel fuel tanks um, around the back of where the old B&Q is, where carpet right is. Um, and we also have the explosive storage at um, Crabbe and we have the airport fuel farm. So as I said, the highest risk of all of those areas is the La Collette, where there is um, a combination of different uh, major hazard risks on the site, including the gas works, the fuel farm and the fuel line for the tanker berthing. Um, it falls under the coma regulations and therefore we would assess um, development in that location based on the PADI land use methodology. The PADI land use methodology is a health and safety executive in the UK methodology, um, which um, helps us to understand the sensitivity of a development that's proposed to take place within proximity to a hazardous installation and whether or not that development would be acceptable. So for example, um, development in the closest proximity to the hazards, um, most developments would not be considered acceptable, particularly where they increase the number of people um, on the site and in the um, outer edges, we would still prevent things um, like the development of homes and things like hospitals or healthcare facilities facilities where the sensitivity of that development is particularly high and should the occupants need to um, evacuate for whatever reason they would struggle. So we would not like to see those kind of developments taking place in that area. So that, that policy framework helps us to make those uh, decisions and would apply. Uh, and those that those um, boundaries that you see on the uh, draft Bridging Island Plan proposals map are the same as those which were proposed in 2017 or introduced in 2017 in a supplementary um, planning guidance policy note which updated um, the boundaries in light of an additional study that was undertaken uh, by the government of Jersey in relation to the waste park and the number of people on the site as a result of that development. So all other developments um, within proximity, um, within those defined zones, are um, what we would call consultation distances, where we would simply just consult with the um, fire service and the health and safety inspectorate uh, in Jersey. And should there be any particular concerns uh, raised by um, those two, it may be um, e extended into the island-wide hazard review group, which has offices from various departments of government of Jersey, where we would consider um, the, the nature of the hazard and whether or not a, a more formal response from um, that group is also required. 
as a new policy in the plan, um, we have uh, the new extended or altered hazardous installations policy. Now, this um, it came about in light of um, a bit, essentially a gap that was identified in the policy that we weren't explicit on how we would deal with new or extended hazardous installations. And that is, um, for example, a new or extended fuel farm or um, other installation that may pose a significant hazard to the population of Jersey. So we now have specific tests that they, they would be required to meet and they include that they are essential to meet a specific need, um, that the proposal is the best option relative to the assessment of alternatives. So that could be down to um, not only the design and nature of the proposal, but also uh, the location of the proposal, that that is the, the best location for a hazardous um, installation, should there be a best location, um, and that it's not simply just the, the land that is available to the developer. And that also that the risk and environmental impact has been assessed to be acceptable or manageable. So that means that we would require in particular a study to consider the public safety risk as a result of the development. Does anybody have any questions? And then finally, we get on to the um, the airport zone. So um, the first is uh, the aircraft noise zones, which you can see here in the blue and black dotted line, um, the green and black and the purple and black. Um, basically, these are to protect the amenities um, of those that surround the airport based on the, the sound levels uh, arising from the aircraft movements. So within um, zones one and two, there's actually very little uh, residential development at the, the easterly part of um, zone two. There is some uh, residential development, uh, but the majority of residential development falls within uh, the zone three, which is where we would expect things like um, triple glazing and other measures to ensure that the amenities of the occupants of that de development are suitably protected uh, from aircraft noise. Uh, within the closer areas, uh, we would we would try and limit uh, development to that which is uh, where there's no alternative, or uh, because it is simply part of the core operations of the airport. And then the other zones that we have for the airport are the public safety zones. Um, this is the uh, orange and black and the red and black zones that you see uh, defined on the map here. Um, within a public safety zone two. Uh, where there is a number of residential um, and commercial uses, we would not like to see an increase in the number of people living in or using um, the land in those areas. And that's because the more people that um, stay in those areas for a, a period of time is the higher um, risk and probability should there be um, a, a major incident that somebody could be uh, injured or worse. And of course, it's, it's highly unlikely and very, very rare for there to be um, uh, in incidents in and around the airport, but that is not to say that we shouldn't appropriately manage the risk and ensure that we are not exacerbating it by encouraging more people to live in an area that's been designed, uh, defined as potentially hazardous. Um, in the uh, black and red um, rectangles to uh, the west of the airport, you can see there is it is more highly limited and we would not like to see any other residential use in that area. I think that at the moment there are, there are two residential properties um, defined within those zones um, and in, in an ideal world, they they perhaps wouldn't be there, um, but we certainly wouldn't want to see any more residential uses in those areas. And I think this now concludes the uh, policies. So before I um, move on to the uh, the how to engage part um, of the webinar, does anybody have any questions or anything to say at all on the either the um, the airport and the public safety policies we've just discussed or any other parts of the webinar? Okay, Natasha, John again. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think I think what David and I are trying to raise is the fact that there's lots of associations out here and, and you know recognize scientifically re uh, reports that mm -hmm. the government is ignoring um, and has ignored in the past and the problem with that is that um, policy advisors like yourself and the island plan team good work as, 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 as it is that you're doing if you don't have the correct information about the dangers that face us and the quanti the quantifiable 
dangers of the damage that's happening to the environment, then it's difficult for you to, to interpret those dangers correctly into the island plan. You can only go on the evidence that's presented to you by your, by your, by your own civil servants and government. And when we have a situation, for instance, where Dave produces a 10 year sh um, shellfish report, which is, you know, it's proper scientific evidence and it's turned down by civil servants and sort of poo pooed before even John Young has a, has a chance to read it. And we get a situation where um, I report the pollution at the horizon site, but it takes them six months to um, to bring that to court. What that proves is that what we need and what would help you and the public out here is an independent environmental regulator. At the moment, if there's any pollution events, the government um, is either responsible for or through their quangos responsible for or likely to proceed, proceed with, you know, without the proper controls, then there's nobody independent to oversee them. The government is overseeing itself, and that I see, and I think Dave would agree with me, is the biggest problem. So my sympathies for your position, and I can understand, you know, that you're you're maybe a little bit uncomfortable with David and I complaining uh, at this moment in time because you 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 have a job to do, and it has the, its limitations. And if you're not given the correct evidence, then obviously it's it's a problem for you. Obviously, Dave and I will both write in email um, our suggestions and comments. But thanks for listening today. Uh, thank you, John. And I mean, just just to um, reiterate that um, it's not it's certainly not my position um, that any of the evidence or your concerns today um, are being ignored or or dismissed. It's purely that they, they need to be submitted through the right channel in this particular instance. So I do very much encourage you to set out everything that you said today um, into your representation into the island plan, and that will be considered by the Minister for the Environment and also fed into the public inquiry process. So just to, to reassure you that um, your comments made, as long as they are relevant to the issues dealt with by the island plan, um, then, then they will be considered. OK, did I understand that Jason had his hand up. Not, I can't see, but um, OK. Um, can I just add something, Natasha, if Jason isn't? Uh, yes, he has. OK, was it? Is, um, hello there, Jason. I, can, I can wait. <laughs> OK, well, whoever would like to go next. So, um, Jay, Natasha, can I just add one thing, please? Mm -hmm. You just said that we can we're a liberty to, and, and are welcome to write in representations to the island plan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they will be considered. Do you know how many years we've been doing that? Do you know how many years reports? I, you know, I'm 71 now. I've been doing this since I was in my 40s, and we, well, speaking for myself, our team has worked their socks off for 25 years doing this getting report after report, knocked back, knocked back, knocked back, until you think. Hang on, is it really worth it doing anymore? And then regarding the independent regulation uh, and that, uh, that John just suggested we do, the, 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 the thrust of our report is that we do need independent regulation. It's no, it's no reflection on the offices in post at the moment um, because they are part of the government and they have other things to answer for. But it, it seems to me, and it's not just seems to me, it is the case that we do need independent regulation. And when I say independent, John Young, you said John Young to write to John Young. John, Rung, Young. John Young's position on this is yes, he agrees with us, but he has changed his position in the last th three years from saying, yes, we do need independent regulation and we do need an independent regulator into the one of actually, I agree with you, but what we need is our existing regulators to have more independence and more power within the civil service. Now that is the total opposite of what we need. And it's no disrespect to existing regulators and so forth. They all have their position, but the regulators who we've had problems with over the years um, are, if they were given more power and became more independent, then we might as well all just lie down in the road and say, okay, just drive over us and poison the children with, with asbestos stuff, because this is just what's happening. It, it's, it, I could spend, and I probably will spend, days and days and days and days and another two weeks on more reports. The last report was a 25 year report. We called it a 10 year report, but it actually covered 25 years. It took me and now my team, I suppose, six weeks. We're not paid. We do it because we really exist to, we exist to try and make things better in our island. 
we want things to be done well to an international staff standard to best practice and jersey does not follow best practice it always says well actually we did it wrong but we'll try better next time and it does this all the time and every time uh, we get a seminar or a webinar or a presentation at town hall the same thing happens and we get you know chaps, uh, chaps and ladies like yourself give us great presentations but when we ask the difficult questions you get referred to somewhere else to a report or there will be something you can put your points to we are registered consultees and we have been consultees for a long time and we have not been consulted at any point in the last two or three years about these issues we don't want to do it retrospectively we want to be encouraged to do it in a proactive way before the event and before things happen so all i can say is yes we will write in yes we will do what you suggest but i have very little faith that any of this will do any good and i'm afraid that is my position and i'm afraid that's all i can say at the moment that um we will come up and, and deliver the truth as it has happened and 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 give you the figures and and give you the the the, 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 the events as they happen and bring out reports that's all we can do but i I'm very, 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 very embarrassed to be called a Jerseyman sometimes, very embarrassed, because our democracy is really not a democracy. Our our governance is not very good, uh, as, as well, we all know what's happened recently with the governance, and we're sort of sliding into a retrograde situation whereby um, the population is overtaking everything, and the infrastructure can't cope, and now it's a case of let's see what we can shoe all into the last bit of uh, of land which was supposed to be for the public's good and at the at the risk of the population and this just cannot be allowed to happen but unfortunately it seems like it's going to happen and there's only a few people who know the history who have done all the work over the last 25 years who know from when it was beaches and who've been looking after the beaches and if you're going to swat us away at this sort of point in time and say oh you can write in you know write in we will consider your views i mean we are doing this before you were born i'm sorry but this is something that we feel so passionately about and we give our time and our money and our energy into doing and yet we're not we're on the list of consultees and what happens we're not even brought into a table we haven't been invited to meet officers nothing it is just not the position that we should be in in 2021 and if you're going to go ahead carry on go ahead we will try to do our best and i will make it plain that um, I will probably have to retire off this because I've been in Ill, Ill health due to some of this in the past and I cannot keep going and keep going. And our team is very good. Uh, and John's got, a, you know, John's very helpful and he's got a team and he's got a new, new, a new, a new band of uh, team that he does with, with his, 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 he does an awful lot of work for the parish. He does an awful lot of work for the environment. And we have lots of people who do an awful lot of work, but they do not feature in your consultee list. They do not feature. It's always retrospectively I'll come in and put your objections in, come in. You never ask us in, you never ask us in for chat what you're going to do, what you really want to do, who you're going to pre present this thing with. It's always retrospectively. And I really, really, that's all I have to say. I'm sorry, it's a bit long winded, but I mean, I've been doing it so long now. I just feel that it's really, really sad that we've come to a pass where we're even considering doing something that's going to be so disruptive to the community and so bad for the human health of the community and the marine environment, as we've demonstrated in our report, is degrading and degrading and degrading. In 10 years time, we will have no shellfish off the beach because they will be toxic. There'll be no farming industry off the beach uh, and there will be nothing in our shores and our waters that will be worth anything. And if we want to go that route, then I'm afraid well, Jersey will have to go that route. But I think that the flags need to be put up now in before the island plan. That's all I have to say. OK, thank you. I mean, I, um, probably one or two things just to come back on there. And uh, and I uh, please do not take this as being uh, intentionally dismissive in any way at all. Um, but clearly you have um, concerns about the um, management of waste and regulation of waste and treatment of contaminated land in Jersey, which are all very, very important issues um, for which the Minister for the Environment is responsible for. Um, however, just so you are um, you are clear and aware of how those comments can influence the, the draft bridging island plan is um, 
you were talking about very live issues about development that is happening now and issues that are happening now. Um, the policy framework of the, the uh, Bridge Island Plan is more limited in what it can do in that respect. So in terms of waste regulation, for example, the, the actually island plan cannot do anything about waste regulation because that's a completely different function um, of, within the Minister for the Environment. So this the island plan is um, developed under the auspices of the planning and building law. Um, and of course, you've got the, the relevant um, waste uh, legislation that you would be looking to target for particular management of waste. So there are a number of your comments which can be um, obviously very relevant to the development of the island plan. But um, just to be clear that there is a conflation there in terms of the role of regulation of waste and um, a, a planning document, which is uh, slightly, slightly different, but very much hear your concerns and, and please do put them all in writing um, anyway, and they will be considered by the minister. Thank you. And uh, Jason, did you have uh, uh, something to say? Yes, um, just a Thank quick uh, question. Back on your last slide, uh, WER 11. Yep. OK, um, just a, a bit of uh, confirmation, please. Is number one the yellow and black line and number two the red and black line? Um, it's the other way around. Oh, so number, <laughs> number one is the red and black. Yep. And number two is the yellow. And black. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. No, no, so other way around. Sorry, the, the highest level of protection is the uh, black and red, which is where we don't want to see um, any increase in the number of people. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so on that point, we will uh, move on on the uh, how to engage. So uh, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, that today's webinar was was really about just telling you the content of the of this part of the island plan. Uh, a number of the issues that have been raised today are touched on in other chapters of the plan. So, for example, the general development chapter touches on contaminated land, um, and we also have um, links to the develop um, to the management of of um, waste and processing of waste in um, the uh, managing waste. Sorry, the minerals and waste chapter of the plan, which was the webinar we had last week. So I do urge you to read the plan in its entirety if you have um, some uh, concerns or, or, or um, would like to know more about other issues that are related to your concerns. And um, in response also to uh, David and, and John's points in particular, we do have our one-to-one -one, uh, sessions where you can talk uh, to a planner. I said it will be uh, Kevin Pilly, who's the head of Place and Spatial Planning, who will be taking the session um, on Friday where you can have a one-to-one -to -one discussion to talk about um, issues that are concerned to you and, and flesh out how that you may wish to um, submit your representation. But to be really clear, um, verbal representations into this process are not counted. It is a statutory process whereby you must make your comments in writing. So I do urge you to uh, go online uh, into the consultation portal and submit your comments there or to email the island plan at gov.je uh, with your comments which will be registered. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining the webinar today and uh, I hope to see some of you tomorrow at our final webinar on managing emissions. Thank you. <laughs>